It is the afternoon of the 3rd of March 2009, and at the city archives of Cologne, everything feels pretty normal. Nearby, some works are underway on a new stud barn line. As for usual business of the city mumbles along in the background, all of a sudden, the relative calm is shattered. The city's archives have plunged into a pile of debris, dust and chaos. Many are feared missing, and one of the most important repositories of German and wider European historical documents have been crushed under tons of rubble. Welcome to Plainly Difficult. My name is John, and today we're looking at the Cologne Archives disaster. Today's video wouldn't have been possible if it wasn't for my Patreon, YouTube and Ko-fi members. If you want early access to the channel's videos, then you can from just £1 per month. And as always, the links will be in the pinned comment below. Cologne. This is the city of Cologne. It's in Germany, which is around here in a map. Now, I'm not going to go through the history of the city, apart from two important landmarks, its archives and its Stadtbahn. Let's start with the former. The Cologne City Archives, officially the historical archive the city of Cologne, is truly an impressive institution. It dates all the way to around the 1320s. Over the centuries, it would amass an impressive collection of manuscripts, documents, paintings and a variety of other historical artefacts. The archives in the, in the late 1800s would gain a fully purpose-built building. Previously, it had been fragmented in different buildings across the city, but after the construction of the 1897 archive, the fascinating and culturally valuable materials found inside had a safe place to exist. The building and location that housed the archives would change yet again in the 1970s. A new six-storey building was built at Severinstrasse in the southern part of Cologne city centre. It looks very 1970s, but its brutal appearance actually did have some use. Its thick facade helped with temperature control in that it protected its interior from weather fluctuations. The archive had an extensive ground floor and basement complex in which the centre of the lowest level had a 60 centimetre thick armoured concrete vault for the archive's most valuable and important items. By the mid-1990s, the building had reached its maximum capacity, requiring records and other materials to be stored at other archives under contract. But for now, we now need to talk about another part, important part of the city, its metro or Stadtbahn. The City Train of Cologne. OK, I know, it's not actually called City Train, it's Stadbahn, but that's kind of its literal translation. It's a light rail system, with a history going back to the 1870s, with horse-drawn trams ferrying Colonnas around. Is that a name for someone who lives in Cologne? Uh, I don't know, let me know in the comments, I'd love to find out. Anyways, the network of individual companies became city-owned in 1900, and by 1907... The horses were sent packing, instead having traction from electric power. Much of the intricate network in the city centre got destroyed by the big unfriendliness of 1939 to 1945, and in the aftermath, many parts weren't rebuilt in favour of cars and buses for passenger transport. However, in the face of this, the network would be expanded into once again, this time into more of a metro-style system with the first tunnel sections beneath the city opening between 1968 and 1970. New routes will be built and opened, which leads us onto the north-south route. This would be a new 4 km long line involving new tunnels under the ancient city. This new section would have seven new stations. The project was planned to take eight years beginning in 2003. The project was undertaken by a consortium of companies, BAM Group, Zublin and Billefinga Group. I probably said that quite wrong. The tunnels ran as single bores dug using a TBM. However, structures such as stations and crossovers were built using a more traditional cut and cover method, basically digging a big hole in the ground, installing the fin you want, and then filling up the hole. One of these was the Weidmark Turnoff, right next to the city's archive. 
It was a 28 metre deep pit. To hold back the earth around it, diaphragm walls were employed. These are rather expensive, but vital elements in building some subterranean structures. Initially, narrow channels are dug using specialist equipment, and long story short, the channels are filled with steel reinforced concrete. The area is then dewatered. The hole is then extracted, revealing the protected diaphragm walls. Around this time, grouted anchors are then installed to hold the walls in place. On top of all this, a temporary steel ceiling is placed over the top of the excavation. The walls actually went down lower than the floor of the cutting for the crossover, creating walls with a depth of 45 metres below the surface. During the construction of the cutting, water was to be continuously pumped from the hull, and during this the area seemed to be sufficiently watertight. So once the hole was deep enough, the track bores would be exposed, which were dismantled to reveal the area that the crossover would be placed in. Over the top of the crossover was to be placed a permanent ceiling, which would then have the backfield soil on top of it. This point hadn't been reached by the 3rd of March 2009. Instead, final excavation works were still being undertaken, which leads us on to... The Disaster. It is the early afternoon of the 3rd of March 2009 and construction work is carrying on as normal at the Weidmark turnoff. Workers are chipping away at the final part of the excavation. At around 1.45pm, workers started noticing water gushing into the excavation pit on the south east corner around the floor area. Quickly earth was joined by water inflow. Workers quickly escaped the work site and began warning road users and occupants of the archive and nearby apartment buildings. Around 45 people were able to escape these buildings, with the majority of which being employees and visitors to the archive. The influx of materials began to undermine the archive's foundations. Eventually the building began to fall over into the excavation. The building smashed into the bottom, blasting dust and debris into the air. This was roughly about 2pm in the afternoon. The building didn't really collapse, instead it kind of slid into the hole. This would make searching of the now unexpectedly diagonally replaced archive rather difficult. Firefighters would have to cut through the building's concrete columns to get down to the lowest section of the wrecked building. Most people had escaped the collapse, however it was becoming increasingly aware that two people were missing. These were two men who had been asleep in the adjacent housing buildings. Their bodies would be found a few days after the initial collapse. To stabilise the excavation, concrete was poured into the base and tunnel bores were blocked off to stop material flowing down into the already completed sections of the lime. There was one massive issue, however, with the cleanup: the thousands of valuable documents. You see, you can't just get cracking on with a spade and a skip. Well, you can if you don't care about preservation. Instead, recovery was like an archaeological project, meticulously digging out each item. Because much of the influx of material was water, many of the documents had been soaked, which interestingly, as part of the recovery, required them to be quick frozen. This stopped the growth of deadly mould, and it also bought time for later restoration. It was estimated at the time of the collapse there was around full amount of 30 kilometres of shelf storage space inside the archives, all of which was full with very, very important historical documents. Which leads us on to the investigation. So why did the building built in the 1970s fall into the big hole? Well, clearly the big hole had a lot to do with it. Throughout the project and during the tunnelling process, the building was closely monitored for any movement, as noted in New Civil Engineer magazine. The tunnelling was monitored by a barometric level measuring system at the surrounding buildings and extensor meters every hundred or so meters in between the tunnels as they were being built. This ruled out that the boring works were the cause of the weakening of the structure. Instead, this pointed the interest back to the excavation pit. It was found that no grout underpinning was undertaken by the contractors. KVB had assessed that the building didn't need it, even though apparently over 40 other buildings along the route had been underpinned. 
water had been over pumped as it was found on the site by double the allowed limit. On top of that, 28 falsified documents regarding the construction were found during the investigation. It was also found that the diaphragm wall next to the archives was faulty. This had allowed water and silty material to wash out from underneath the building, allowing it to topple over into the pit. It was found that during the digging of the diaphragm wall, reportedly a 3.4 metre wide shovel had been substituted with a 2.8 8 meter wide digging tool after it had been damaged during construction. It was looking like the crossover excavation was just done very shoddily, which resulted in the eventual failure. The consortium would be required in 2020 to pay a 600 million euro settlement between them. This was after criminal proceedings had been brought and dropped against three people involved in the project, which happened in 2018. Interestingly, BAM, one of the consortium on the project was snarled up in another concrete issue which I've done a video on, which the link will be on the screen around here somewhere. Anyways, the line and more precisely the crossover have still not been completed, pushing back the estimated completion date to 2028 or 2029, which is not great for anyone concerned or the financial situation of the city. So that's my video on the Cologne Archive disaster. It's going to be a free on my scale, and this is what I've got for my root cause analysis card. Do you agree? Let me know in the comments below. This is a Plain Default production. All videos on the channel, Creative Commons, Attribution, Share, Like, Licensed. Plain Default videos are produced by me, John, in a currently quite nice corner of Southern London, UK. And all I have to say is thank you very much for watching, and Mr. Music, can you play us out, please?